What's up, Reef Builders? Welcome to another episode of Reef Recap. As you can see, I'm in St. Louis at Remy's house with his aquatic aesthetic in his house. We're going to be talking about a lot of random things tonight. There was not really an agenda for this episode, but you know, we weren't able to go live the other night because we were at Nook's house. Nook is a very old St. Louis resident who helped establish Slash, which is a local group. He had some huge tanks in wall, very impressive. Like, I don't even know how many gallons it was, probably like four or 500 gallons. He put in 600 pounds of Fiji live rock, like when it was the last shipment from 2017, into one system. He had 100 pounds of Miracle Mud. There was like a lot of soft corals that I had never even seen before in person, like the yellow neo spagodis or whatever from fiji they're coming in now but i've never seen them in person he also had some some gorgonium i think it was a gorgonium that i've never seen before yeah remy's been taking good care of me he got me some pizza he got me uh some water you know it's been a it's been a fun time staying at remy's house i'm in his basement so i'm just like in the bahama llama studio like at 4 a.m just like channeling the llama i'm like this is this is where i used to watch videos and stuff but uh i tried st louis style pizza which i didn't know was a thing there's some like unique cheese blend i can't remember what the hell the name is but okay so mozzarella swiss and provolone the swiss was interesting because it's kind of got like the sharp flavor so it was a little bit different than the other pizza i've had but uh it was pretty good it's thin crust which i like so st louis pizza um, staying at Remy's, we went to Nook's house and got a bunch of frags. He had an aquacultured yellow Fiji leather from like eight years ago. This big, crazy. We'll have a video out on his stuff. We're going to do a whole uh, tank review of it. So what else did we do? We went to all the different shops. I found some cool corals. There were some nice soas in one of the shops. Um, like got a Grim Reaper colony. Yes. Yes. We had emos. I liked it. It was good. It was nice to see you, Danny. Nice to see you, Tien. It was great to meet you guys. I've seen you on Facebook for many years, so it's good to meet you in person finally. Got to meet a lot of people this weekend at the show. Went to the St. Louis Swap, the Reefing USA one. Um, gave a speech about coral pathogens. I think I might have went a little bit too heavy on the data. <laughs> I had just like eight or nine graphs at one point. Um, I probably should have broke it down a little bit more, but... I don't think we recorded it, but I can certainly give the presentation live at some point if you all want to see it. I broke down the general pathway for how coral get infected, um, kind of the stress response. I did the whole biochemical pathway for DMSP metabolization, infochemical production and stuff. So it was a lot of fun, but um, I think it was a little bit too data heavy. It was more science and less hobby, I think. So I'll probably go more hobby, less science next time. But uh, the frag swap location was crazy. We pulled up last night to set up, and Remy was like, you know, this place is really haunted, right? And I was like, he's just messing with me. Okay, so get this. So he told me this whole history lesson. We talked about it. So where this location is, it's right by the Mississippi River. And back when cholera was really big, they had a hospital there that was a quarantine camp. So there was every single person on the Mississippi that came to try to get into St. Louis stopped here. And they basically just had, like, there was no antibiotics. There was nothing. So they just had to live through the disease, like, burnout style. And then there's just massive unmarked graves literally everywhere, <laughs> like, all over where the frag swap was. And, uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty wild. So haunted frag swap. There was no internet at the frag swap, so taking cards was difficult. There was a disco ball. So that was cool, um, but it was a good time. It was a smaller venue. Got to meet a lot of local people from St. Louis that I've have been like, I met Michael. Michael was there. Great conversations with him. I met Danny. I met Tien. So it's been a fun trip in St. Louis. And um, Remy and I have been recording a lot of content, so we'll have some videos soon. Let's see. I do not think I have seen like a, a Maxima on the hobby. Uh, taxonomy is not my strong suit though. Like say, if you want to talk about micro, like applied microbiology or biochemistry, yeah, but taxonomy, I don't know, man. I mean, a lot of it I know now is just determined through genetics. So like morphological characteristics, at least from my point of view, kind of seem like a wash to some extent. 
Um, I'm sure that there's still like defining characteristics with the Coralites and such, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about, I can't tell you like the depth of this Paragoniastria makes it distinct from this other species. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> that's not me. We need someone on Reef Builders that's good at um, actually doing taxonomy because I don't think we have anyone where that's like their, you know, super strong suit anymore. So I can tell you the basic stuff, but when it gets into the weird stuff, I don't know. You want a haunted frag shop, Frankenstein. I've heard that Frankenstein's pretty good. I've heard a lot of good things about that. Um, is it during Halloween? Is it in the fall, I'm assuming? Yeah, I'm definitely, I graduate in May. So my goal is to do like the Reefing USA circuit. I've been talking to Bill about doing it forever. Um, probably some of the other traveling shows. So if there's like the Corals Farmer Market and stuff. But my goal is to be at a lot of shows. I think it's a lot of fun to travel, get to sell coral I grow, get to meet all of you. September 28th. I'm officially done with school. I'll probably try to come. Yeah, we're trying to have an Ohio trip, I think, eventually. I think, like, see eye-catching, see tidal gardens, go see, like, a lot of the shops and such. So, well, that's great, Michael. I'm glad that they're doing well for you. Yeah, everything I sell is aquacultured, so it's not going to, shouldn't melt on you. If you cut it, maybe, but that's different. Yeah, what else is there to see in Ohio? Tell me about Ohio. Let's plan an Ohio trip now. Yeah, it's like the Than eye catching. There's a lot of stuff already. It's just like thinking off the top of my head. We can go during when a show is, so we can, you know, have a third thing to do. But I think there's probably some stuff that we're not thinking of. Like I don't really know a lot of people in Ohio. I know there's a large community, but I don't know a lot of people personally that are there. So what do you guys want to talk about? I figured this would just be like a little bit more free form tonight. Usually we have a topic of things, but since we're on the, the business trip here, it's a little bit more open. So we can talk about coral disease. I can answer questions. We can talk about anything you guys want to talk about besides taxonomy because I don't know. <laughs> oh, is that the Black Widow guy? Yeah, okay. He's, he's cool. I didn't know he was in Ohio. That'd be cool. That'd be cool to see his setup. Yeah, the videos I've seen a bit are pretty impressive for sure. Um, yeah. Okay, so... I've had St. Louis style pizza. I've had Chicago style pizza. I've had Detroit style pizza. I've had New York style pizza. Are there any other regional pizza variations that I am not aware of that I should try? Because I didn't know that St. Louis existed. Did not know there was a distinct pizza style. And Remy mentioned that and I was like, he's messing with me. There's no way there is a, um, ooh, par and per. I'll one up you. Have you heard of DLI? That's the move. DLI is very interesting. It is something I want to play with. Um, so yeah, you got PAR, photosynthetically available radiation, PER, photosynthetically usable radiation, which is when you take into account spectrum. There's DLI, which is daily light interval, which is taking the average PAR and dividing it by the time that it's, uh, it's actually you know put out, I believe, is how you calculate it. But what's interesting about DLI is you could set up a light schedule, which is based on DLI alone. And um, I've got a buddy that's messing with this with Acros, and he's having a lot of good results. So he will have a basically like a poly photo period. So he'll have on for four hours, off for three hours, on for four hours. He doesn't have any 12 hour, hour cycling. So then basically he gets net more uh, growth he has to have higher nutrients to compensate for like potential bleaching and things like that. But uh, just because of higher, you know, you have more, a longer photo period in that instance, even if it's broken up. But I can't remember how he determined like the three hours off, but it was through, um, he found some paper that showed that like respiration resets in the zooxanthellae after that amount of time. I and mean, he's had success anecdotally with it. So I think the DLI is something to play with that could be pretty interesting. But um, yeah. Yeah, we released, uh, you know, this is the recap, so I guess I can talk about that. We had a couple articles out this week. We had Microbial Men on Reef Therapy. We also had the new Meckley Awards video. So Chris and Remy went around Reef Stock, and they picked out their favorite corals. There was a very cool plate coral of uh, some sort. I don't know the species, but I saw it in person, and it looked like a rainbow chalice, like one of the jelly beans from Worldwide Corals or like a Sexy Corals Dynamite. It was a plate, but it looked like a rainbow chalice. It had like a yellow rim. It was very nice. I was going to buy it. There's a nice blasto colony too, um, like orange and purple. Very cool. 
But uh, yeah, we're going to have a Reef Therapy podcast episode coming out sometime early next week, which should be pretty exciting. We had Alan Vo on, concoction guy, um, and we had a very informed discussion about it. I think everyone has just kind of been in awe about the idea of it, but um, we had a little bit more in-depth discussion about optimizing it and the practicality of the existing methods, which I think will be very informative for people. And it's distinct from every other conversation I've seen them have, which has just been people asking them the 10 basic questions that everyone does, which is like, how did you make this? How do you use it? I think we got into the nitty gritty about why he chose the specific strains he did and things like that. And I think we had a very good conversation about a potential future angle for it, which is a lot better and a lot more efficient, I think. So what are your thoughts on sand sifting fish? Um, yeah, if you've got a sand bed, they're certainly practical to have um, for sure. But the thing with gobies and stuff like that is they can A, rearrange, rearrange the sand bed to an extent to where it can mess with your rock work and things. If you don't have it underneath the sand or you don't have it secure and stable, so that's always a risk if you've aquascaped in an odd or unstable way. As well as that, they can always, like, you know, they have sand that comes out of the gills residually so it can get on, like, any coral you have on the sand. So that can... That can cause issues, I think. Um, I like conches for sand sifting, typically. I just tend to have a lot of those in my systems where I do have sand, just because they don't really make as much of a mess, but they can still clean things up. Also eat, you know, algae, which is nice, like on the lower base rocks and things. And they're just kind of goofy looking, too. But, I mean, there's nothing wrong with sand sifting fish by any means. But, uh, yeah, I think there, there's plenty of ways to skin that cat. Typically, in my grout systems, I just don't have sand at all. Because... Uh, I mean, I have t tub sand um, in the sump, but having sand with the coral, that's a, yeah, can can be a no-no. You can't have as high a par, I mean, sorry, flow, and then different microbial populations on every grain of sand, which can cause issues in a pathogenic sense, I think. Um, yeah. When will microbial men be coming back? We need to talk to everyone. I have a meeting with Eli and Andrew uh, this coming week about um, the whole community science project. So I'll probably talk to them then and talk to everyone else. We got a whole little group chat. So <laughs> we'll probably, um, yeah, plan some things pretty soon. We're probably going to have, instead of like all, what, five, six of us on there, we'll probably have smaller breakout groups where we focus heavily and do a deep dive on specific subjects. So like we'll talk with Eli about like the genetic technology and next generation sequencing. We can talk to uh, Kenneth about... Um, purple non-sulfur bacteria and diazotrophic bacteria, we can talk to, um, this might be a fun conversation that no one's really talked about, but I was thinking of having a dual article or conversation, excuse me, with Taras about the phycosphere. So something I've came across a lot reading about the coral microbiome is the associated microbiota with uh, phytoplankton. So typically when you have a phyto bloom, um, you have associated symbiotic bacteria with the phytoplankton as well. So there are good and bad guys in terms of uh, phyto populations too. So theoretically, if you had a cult, like most cultures that we have are not going to be truly pure culture in terms of phytoplankton, unless you, you know, they've cleaned them up with antibiotics or um, cereal dilution to a very, very high amount, which typically that'll happen if you have some of the commercial strains that have been cleaned up by universities. But for the average person buying phyto, you are likely to have some amount of bacterial contamination but some of that is naturally associ like associated microbiota, which is kind of an interesting rabbit hole. Um, hmm. What's my favorite award at Reefstock? What did I see that I thought was really cool at Reefstock? There was a candy cane that I saw that was almost pure white. It wasn't bleached, though. It was like a teal one, but you shift it even more teal towards the white side. And then the septa, like the, the skin above the septa, was a, like a light red. So I thought that was very unique. I got it. I'm going to write an article about it. I'm waiting for it to get happy in my system and acclimate so it'll get um, real fluffy. And then I can take some macros. But I thought it was really cool to see red in a candy cane. So I just like unique stuff. Um, yes, I am a daylight spectrum kind of guy. So my thoughts when it comes to growing coral are to mimic and chase the sun as much as you can. So I use 15 K halides with T5. So I have a UVA UVB bulb and an infrared bulb. And then I have reef brights for the 420 nanometer peak that gives you the pop. So my spectrum that I have output wise is, uh, like UVB to infrared. 
And, you know, that kind of goes along with the sunblock theory of pigment development. So the idea is if you expose coral to a broader wavelength of light, each wavelength will correlate to pigment development. So that kind of will theoretically activate those transcri transcription factors, which would allow for those pigments to be developed in response to blocking that spectrum of light. And I've, anecdotally, I've certainly been able to see much faster growth and better coloration, which seems to support that. So it's kind of the whole idea of a broader spectrum gives you more colors and higher par gives you brighter existing colors. So yeah. Uh, yeah, Sci-Hub is my best friend. Um, if there are things you can't find on Sci-Hub, there's a couple newer databases which are open source, so Nexus is a good one. So typically, um, if there's newer articles, like any 2024 stuff, Sci-Hub won't have access to them for like a month or so, or like there's kind of a latency there, lag period. Um, so yeah, Nexus will sometimes have those. And then... Yeah, if you can't get them through those two, you kind of just got to ask some friends, unless there's something else that I don't know about. But yeah, SciHub is, use it every day. <laughs> Absolutely. I did deep sand bed back in the tw day 20 years ago. Old tank syndrome scared me away. These days I have a bare bottom. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, plumb in a remote deep sand bed. But when I say deep sand bed, I don't mean like six inches. I mean like a whole 50 gallon drum of sand. Like, I want, like, feet of sand bed to see if I can get a really, really diverse anaerobic community and try to get some of, like, the, the methane producers on purpose. And I want to see how that can affect the microbiome. Uh, my thoughts are that there's a lot of regions that we simply don't have a, a good or at least a large environment for. Um, the, and we could, we could basically create targeted environments to grow those microbes. So, you know, having very large anaerobic pockets could maybe be, maybe be beneficial. You could probably get some sulfur reduction in there, which could be, I think, important for things like the whole DMSP cycle or sulfur cycling in general. Um, I think the aquabiomics live sand is interesting. I think it's a step in the right direction for controlled diversity to exist in the market to kind of this in between completely complete sterility of live or our dry rock and then the uncontrolled kind of chaos of live rock. So it's collected in deep offshore sites. So you have some of the core families that are associated with pelagic bacteria. They're so, you know, modal waterborne bacterial species. So pelagibacter, Oceosporiliae. There's a small population of Rhodobacter aceae because they're biofilm producers in the sand. So introducing that as a source, you're likely, you're unlikely to have any specific coral pathogens because they're collected in cold water, but uh, you're also likely to have some of those core groups that are found universally across the ocean as picoplankton and are involved in sulfur uh, cycling, which I think could be very beneficial. So the one issue with it is it comes in a very small amount. So I think it would be beneficial to buy it and have like a brute trash can of some dry aragonite, and then you could seed it and then add like a carbon source and things like that to then basically culture the microbiome there. It's kind of the same idea as using live rock to seed dry rock. And then you would have a large tub of that existing aquabiomic sand. Um, yeah, my Facebook, yes. If you go on Facebook, I have a huge uh, album of all the zoas that I named and released. Yep. Let's see. Shallower col colorful corals have more sunblock pigments, while deeper colorful corals have more fluorescent pigments. Yeah, that's probably true, but I think that, like I say, I need to look more into the genetic side of this, but this is more headcanon, not based on data. But my thoughts are that many corals likely still have the capability to have, you know, pigments that are derived from that sunblock pathway. So for instance, deeper water corals like, you know, Welsophilia, tra well, tracheas now, I think they've been reclassified all as tracheas, I'm not sure. But, you know, like even euphilia, fembrophilia, things like that, I've seen color up a lot better under full spectrum uh, lighting compared to only blues. I think that, you know, the really, really deep water stuff, so if you get into like... Um, this is a Caribbean non-photosynthetic species. It doesn't really matter. But, you know, there's stuff that's collected at deeper waters, like Swifty on things in the industry. And I'm sure that there's some photosynthetic corals that are. So, like, oh, like Australophilia wilsoni, right? You know, that's, that's like, you know, collected a little bit deeper waters off of Western Australia, colder waters as well, naturally. I think that those are likely to, you know, unlikely to color up as much to the full spectrum. But I think that you know, probably 75% of the corals in the hobby are likely to color up with exposure to that. I mean, it's a process of artificial selection. If they have some piece of code there to where they can 
have a transcription factor be you know, coded for because of that external stimuli to then generate a pigment, even if it's locked away really anciently and it has not been expressed in an environment. If they've got it, they've got it, and they just need the stimuli. So I don't know. Like I say, I'll have to read more to see if there is evidence of that genetically, but maybe I've seen it anecdotally. Poor reliance on feeding can cause brighter coloration. The coral would have less soaks revealing the pigments more. Yeah, I think that that could certainly be a part of it as well. So, I mean, I'm going to have an article up probably next week about kind of actual ideal coral nutrition. So utilizing ammonia as the primary um, nitrogen source. And there's a very interesting, a couple articles that exist that show correlations between direct coral nutrition and then correlations with how they can um, regulate the zooxanthellae population, how that can affect coloration. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. That's something nice to explore. What about Vibrio? I got some of it and had that in the report. Are you referring to aquabiomic sand? Many Vibrio species are common in the open ocean and not all of them are pathogenic. There are many Vibrio species that are even associated with the coral's holobiont that are relatively beneficial and are very important in nutrient cycling. Um, as with anything, some of these can be opportunistic, but um, typically in terms of our public perception, one bad apple ruins the bunch. But not all Vibrio are pathogenic or have the capacity to be. A lot of them are opportunistic, you know, but uh, Vibrio is natural and expected. <laughs> you and Chris from Poto need to do a podcast. I personally have had so many interesting conversations concerning the bio and honey industry of the uh, Hope of Sea Palooza New York. I don't know if I'll be a Reef of Palooza New York, unfortunately. Um, I'll be going on vacation with my parents, a family vacation for the first time in like five years because I've been in college. Um, and I thought that I was available to go to Rap New York, but... Um, I don't think I will be, which is unfortunate because I would like to go to New York. We may be planning a trip to New York very soon, though. I've been looking into some things, so <laughs> Remy is laughing at me. But um, yeah, I would like to go to New York. I'd love to go to Poto. Definitely would very much like to see that shop. I've not seen any of the New York shops. I've been to Cali, I've been to LA, I've been to Orlando, you know, Miami, etc. So I've seen a lot of the big stores, but I've not seen the New York stores. Um, message me on Facebook. <laughs> I'm getting a website in about two weeks here, but, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Like I say, I'd love to go. I think we'll go a different time, but I will not be able to make rap New York, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, I really want to try, uh, I don't know if any of you know about George Motes, but, uh, is it the burger master, man? He's wrote like a bunch of books about hamburgers. Um, he does like a huge thing, like on first we feast, about uh, regional hamburger styles, but he opened his own restaurant in, in down like somewhere in New York. It's supposed to be very, very good. I'd like to try it and also meet him because like hamburger guy. Um, I've been banned on Reef to Reef twice. My IP address is now banned. <laughs> I've tried to make new emails, but they've banned my IP. I guess I could get a VPN and make one again, but um, that kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. So I've got a humble fish. This, these are not Reef Builders' opinions, by the way. This is the opinions of Salem Clemens. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, yeah, the, the coolest thing that I saw this weekend was going to Nook's house. I mentioned at the beginning that he's an old-school reefer. He's been around since the 90s, and he had, like, two really, really big tanks. They were all plumbed together, but two different displays, same sump. So... I think they were probably like 500 gallons at least. I don't know water volume. I should have asked him, but he had a bunch of, it was like a time capsule. He still used halides on one of them. Like he switched like reef breeders. He's switching back to halides. It was like a hybrid right now, but he had a bunch of old corals that I've just like only seen in pictures. There was a bunch of the old Fiji stuff that I still have not seen coming in again. Like the, like the Neospagodes or whatever leathers. I don't know how to pronounce that, but you probably know what I'm talking about. So he had some of like the yellow finger leathers he had an aquaculture, like seven or eight year old, like yellow sarcophyton um, that was huge. It was like this big. What else? He had some like Gorgonian looking things that I, I don't even know what species they were. We posted them on the page. So if one of you is good at taxonomy, let us know because I don't know what they are. He had some blue digi, but like if you've seen a Birds of Paradise, how it kind of has like the green yellow base with the blue polyps, it was like that, but a digi. So it had kind of a green metallic base with bright blue polyps. Like the blue digis I've seen in the hobby lately have been like purple, right? They're like a blue digi, but this was a striking baby blue digi. Very attractive. 
So yeah, we got a bunch of footage at Nooks. We got a bunch of frags. He had he, all of his fish were like ten plus years old, all huge. He had like a huge bird ras and stuff. I mean, like, yeah, he had a he had a giant white damsel. Never even seen this fish before, but it was like this big. <laughs> he had he basically had tried. He had like added in damsels and goofy stuff to his tank over time. But uh, he has been able to catch all the problem fish over the years, except for this giant white damsel. So we were laughing that it was his Moby Dick. It was his white whale <laughs> because it was huge. It caused issues and he could never catch it. So it was a fun night. He made his brats. He's a really good cook. Had some like cheddar, like jalapeno brats. And we hung out with all the old slash guys and just looked at this time capsule of a tank. Like when I first started the hobby like 10 years ago, I remember walking into a bunch of the um, stores and seeing displays that were very similar to this. The way they were escaped, they had live rock, they had halide still. And it was nostalgic for me because I didn't know what I was doing back then. Like I was like 12, 13 years old, just like, this looks really cool. But now that I'm much older, I can appreciate that like, this is, it's like nostalgia bait, you know? Like I've not seen tanks that are escaped like that or have corals like that that are that large and healthy in a very long time. Typically, a lot of the tanks you see right now, it's just small frags, you know? It's, it's, it's hard to find a tank that's lit like full daylight, white spectrum, that's just like a full reef. And it looked, it was really nice. We'll have a great video out about his tank. But um, yeah. Yeah, so besides that, we went to a couple LFSs. Um, I'm trying to think, there's a Feather Star at one. I was, I'm very close to picking it up. Should I buy the Feather Star? I think I can keep it alive. I've got bacterial cultures, pure culture. I can feed it that. I've got phyto. I've got um, pods. I've got a pretty diverse mix of food. I've had luck with NPS. I think I might try one. Oh, Tyler's setup was very cool. So we went to Tyler's house, inland underscore reef on Instagram. And he's got, I mean, that's kind of the same thing, right? It's like the daylight look. So it really reminded me of snorkeling in estuaries in Florida. And like, you know, basically, um, you know, like mangrove flats. It really was like that. So he used silica-based sand. So sponges could grow. It was a darker sand because of that. And I mean, he's got like eight year old mangroves. The roots grew underneath the sand, came back up, and then on the mangrove roots are covered in coralline. He's got like sarcophytons and like encrusting gorgonians covering them. It was a very like natural scape that was very attractive. And he's got a lot of oddball corals, a bunch of Caribbean gorgonians I've not seen. He like had a bunch of heliopora, branching samacora of different types, like 10 different types of sarcophytons. He had pulsing simularia. So it was really cool to see just a bunch of oddball corals in a type of scape and tank you don't typically see. Not a lot of people kind of go for that biotope aesthetic to where it's mimicking what it looks like in nature. It's typically Windex blue, rainbow colored acros, holy grail torches. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just different. And it's nice to see, like that's what St. Louis has been. It's been like a call back to like old school stuff for me. I've got a bunch of different leathers. I got some really cool stereo nephias that um, were at the show. So, I mean, yeah, I've just got a bunch of leathers all weekend. I got leather frags everywhere I went. <laughs> I got them from Nook. I got them from Tyler. I got them at the show. I got them at the local shops. I'm going to have so many weird finger leathers now. Let's see. I would like to do it. I don't really have the mechanical skills or experience to like solder things together, but I'm sure I could learn. I'd love to learn if there's like an open source thing, or if you want to email me or something about it, I'd love to do it. I would be very interested in making a custom led that can mimic the spectrum of those things. Like, you know, I know that there are like UVA and UVB diodes that exist because they're utilized in like the reptile industry. And I know there's infrared diodes as well, because they're utilized with like cannabis growing things like that. Um, so I think it would be pretty cool to actually employ diodes that can actually emit that wavelength in a reef light and to try to make a light that, um, has full spectrum, true full spectrum. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Joe Rowlett, I think used to write for us actually. Um, I just came across one of his articles like two or three days ago on reef builders from a couple of years ago. And I was like, who wrote this? This is really good. And it was Joe Rowlett. So I think that, um, he has wrote for us in the past. But yeah, we definitely 
don't like since since Jake, like we don't really have a taxonomy guy. We definitely need that. I think that's something we're lacking. We've tried to diversify with expertise in a lot of um, you know other different ways. I got the microbiome thing I talk about, but I don't have the taxonomy side of things. 144 LEDs, nice. Yeah, that would be cool to do soldering and everything for sure. Yeah, um, where do you get the LED diodes from? Just like Alibaba. Like is is there like where where do you get them from? Is there like a solid supplier for them? I guess I'm trying to piece together how I would do this. I mean, I obviously have to. There's not like a micro center for LEDs that I know of, right? Or I can go and put together like a a PC, but yeah, or an LED fixture in this instance. But yeah, if you've got resources for that, hit me up. I would love to uh, learn about it. Cree, that makes sense. There's a lot of noise, sorry. The dogs are going crazy. It happens. What's up? Nice to meet you. Yeah, that would be cool to have like a modular LED on the market. I'm surprised. I mean, I'm sure that it would not be good for the companies because they can't sell like their own, like here's the 50-50 white blue, here's the blue, here's the white, here's the pro, you know, but that would be cool to have someone that could make that like, um, hmm. I don't know enough about like mechanical stuff. Like, is there a way to have a diode to where it's like a, like a, like a slip connection, not a slip connection, you know what I mean? Like you can pop it in and it would actually work almost like how you can like screw in a light bulb. Is there a diode you could clip in and then it would be part of an active like panel to where it then can emit light through it? Cause think about it. You could be like a, like a Lego piece. You could just buy whatever colors you wanted and just pop them into place and make your own layout own um, pattern. And you'd have your own spectrum. Hmm. Someone should do that. I don't want to do it, but someone should do that. That seems like a pretty good idea. Lego lighting. Lego reef lighting. You could come up with like a really good name. Like make it like the whole block thing. Gotta think of like a good name now. There's there's probably something like really good that we can think of that would be like a great play on words. Cooling would be difficult. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Like you see, I don't know about this. This is something that I am completely ignorant about. So you all are educating me about how to make and manufacture lighting. I'm just throwing out random ideas based on the, what little I do know. But if you all want to come up with that, you all should try to do that. Oh, that'd be cool if Hamilton comes back. I would like to get some more halide bulbs besides random shop ones on LED or on eBay. I don't know what I'm saying. Sorry. There you go. Ammonium bicarbonate, man. He's sitting right here. He's just like ignoring me. He's asking me questions through the chat. He's four feet away from me. I've been telling him the whole weekend about how to set up ammonia dosing. And he's over here just like trying to poke and prod. He's been pestering me this whole time. What should what should we do to get back at Remy? He's like, he's been making fun of me this whole weekend. It's really just been this bullying experience for him. I think he wants to feel powerful in some way. I can go the whole psychoanalysis route if we need to. But yeah, someone said, Remy's really prodding you. And I, I've been feeling that lately. There's a lot of external pressure <laughs> from the producer. Yeah, look at this. He's trying to, he's trying to censor me now. Just like getting banned on Reef to Reef all over again. It's like physical censoring. Yeah, mean llama. What to test when ammonia dosing? So typically, if you do the right amount, you're going to have a high enough concentration of the, the nitrifiers to where you're not going to have detectable ammonia. You'll just see an increase in your nitrates at the end. But I definitely, definitely like ammonia dosing. Like, oh, there's so much more data there. I mean, the reason, like a lot of people that dose nitrates will typically have cyano. They're going to have an imbalanced microbiome as well because you're just neglecting the entire nitrogen cycle. So that's one. And there's a lot of data behind that, which I will be happy to share in the article I'm writing. Uh, two, though, is that corals typically utilize ammonia as their primary nitrogen source and don't have the enzymatic capacity to use like nitrates as a nitrogen source. So <laughs> like people that are dosing nitrates to feed their coral, yes, via proxy, you can give them nutrition through the holobiont uptaking that nitrate and then passing on nutrition of the coral, but it's not as efficient as just giving them their primary food source. 
And even then, it's like, I don't remember the numbers. It's like one PPM, one PPM of ammonia is like 13 to 16 PPM of nitrates. So it's a cheaper, more efficient way to dose nitrates anyways. Like <laughs> if you're wanting to up your nitrates, still just dose ammonia because you're saving money. And it's more bang for your buck. You can have a much more concentrated, longer-lasting nitrate dosing solution in a gallon of ammonium bicarbonate in solution compared to a gallon of like potassium or sodium nitrate. Like it's a no-brainer for me. You feed the coral directly, you feed the entire cycle. You're adding the primary initial food source at the start of that path pathway instead of um, the end result. Oh, I sold a bunch of coral. <laughs> <laughs> I was a very active member too who helped the community, but and there are many other people who are not active sponsors on Reef to Reef who sell a lot of coral. Then simply, you know, doesn't seem to cause an issue, but um posted one little thing of some Zoas for sale and you were now banned from Reef to Reef twice. So I don't know, man. They just sniffed me out. I wasn't very obvious about it or anything, but plenty of other people do. I mean, like I was just a hobbyist at the time. I wasn't even really peddling frags. Oh, I could tell him how much he spent at reef stock. Hmm. Hmm. His wife is here, you know, in, in this house. <laughs> um, so, yeah, on some systems I do carbon dose. But uh, we're doing a big community science project with aquabiomics. I have a meeting about it this um week but um yeah so we're going to explore different carbon sources and determine if there's any particular one that will shift the microbiome in a certain way so likely different families of bacteria will metabolize different carbon sources more efficiently the question is which is which so we're going to have a baseline and then carbon dose for a month with a specific carbon source and then have the, uh, you know, results of that. So hopefully we can find something that's going to be useful. Um, I have no idea if one ppm of ammonia is 16 ppm of nitrates. As I said, I don't remember the value. I also hate stoichiometry. I'm a chemistry minor. I took the basics, man. I don't like chem. <laughs> if you want to do the math and do the whole, do the whole equation for me, be my guest. My point is simply that there is a substantial conversion of ammonia to nitrates. I'm not really worried about the particulars. I'm just chilling. You referenced a good amount of carbon dose. Is the ratio of that per volume of gallon? Uh, yeah. So like I say, we're going to test different. Once we find whatever that ideal carbon source theoretically is, we will then mess with concentration. It's all going to depend on your nutrient load though. So, I mean, yeah, you got to really dial that in. It's kind of experiential at that point. Like, um, there's been maintenance accounts where I've dosed like 50 mils of vodka a day on like a 600 gallon system with a very heavy bio load. They have like sharks and eels and such in it. But you know, on a reef tank, um, you know, you can do as like little as like a half mil a day. It depends on what your nutrient concentrations are. Oh no, this was like years ago. I got banned from reef to reef. I've not actually ever spoke to Dave in person. I'm sure he's a great guy. I'm not at a conversation with them. I don't have anything against Reef to Reef. I just um, have been banned on there, and I've not tried to like appeal that. This was like two or three years ago I was banned, so I just never tried to get on again because I was like, I'm probably going to get banned again. So, yeah. And then I can still talk about Coral on Facebook, so it's like to have all this effort of going and logging onto a browser and then typing on a specific forum I can just get on my phone and use my thumbs. I don't know. I can do that on Reef to Reef too, but I guess I'm lazy and I like Facebook. And I became accustomed to it over time. So all the groups and such. <sighs> yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, it's like bio pellets. If you have any really aggressive, um, you know, nutrient reduction method, then you want to dial it up very slowly. <laughs> One ppm ammonia becomes 3.64 ppm nitrate. That's probably right. Regardless. My point is like you're getting more bang for your buck in dosing nitrates by dosing ammonia because there is an increase there through the conversion. If it's 3.64, sounds good to me. Three times the bang for your buck. That's cool though. How would you get better polyp extension at SPS? High flow, getting your traces in order, correct nutrition, the basics, pretty much. 
I mean, that's the thing. A flow is a large part of ex polyp extension generally, but so is feeding, right? A lot of times feed and response. So having a mix of trophic levels in terms of nutrition. So, you know, you can have pods, you can have phyto, you can have bacterial, which can come through carbon dosing. It can come through adding pure culture to things like uh, rhodomonas. It can come through potentially adding things like the PNSB stuff from hydrospace. There's a lot of options there, but I like to typically feed my tank through all trophic levels, all micron sizes, because there's a lot of different sizes of mouth and preference for different sized prey items. And we typically, while well, might like a coral is eating the food source, sometimes we can't tell that very well. And we don't really know exactly what they're eating. But there's a large amount of data that coral have a large amount of uh, their you know, heterotrophic nutrition resolved through pico picoplankton populations. So like Pelagiobacteraceae, for instance, in the open ocean, which means getting a bacterial species that is a simil similar micron size to that or increasing the concentration of that group through something like carbon dosing could probably be beneficial to feeding corals long term. Probably. Like I said, this is not things that are based on data in terms of the actual industry at the moment. But they might be with the aquabiomic stuff. <laughs> um, not mariculture per se, but Monsoon, who is one of the largest exporters from Australia, has a very expansive brooding slash spawning project. And they also have a lot of aquaculture that goes on. So I don't really know. I don't think any mariculture exists to my knowledge, like actually having racks out in the ocean. Um, things are a lot more regulated in terms of coastal space in Australia, obviously because of conservation, things like that that are more progressive. But there, there are a lot of efforts by some of the suppliers to do extensive aquaculture. So about like, I don't know, I don't want to say a third, but like at least a quarter, I bet, of the things from Monsoon they offer are aquaculture. A lot of the encrusting packs and things like that they ship over. But it's a combination of wild collected and spawned on aquaculture traditionally through fragmentation. But yeah, I don't know of any actual mariculture facilities th through the traditional, what we would call mariculture in Endo or something like that. So yeah, that'd be a, an Aussie person. I think Shane was on one night. Like he'd be a good person to answer. I've got a friend uh, that used to be a collection diver for Ultra Corals Australia. I could ask him. I don't know about the regulations, you know, compl like at all. But um, yeah, okay. Yeah, so Remy and I had a little fun. Well, Remy had the idea actually. Um, his thought was, what if we test every single tank at a frag swab? So we were gonna do the microbiome and ICP, but we couldn't get the test in time. So we settled with uh, salinity, phosphates, and alkalinity. So we took water samples from every vendor at the show today, and we were doing triplicates, everything, and averaging it. And we're going to have the variance of all these over all the vendors um, expressed um, as an average. So, so far, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting how different the tanks are. So we'll likely have an article showing, you know, here's kind of like a... Um, <laughs> here's maybe a typical distribution of values at a frag swap. How should you take care of coral? You know, if you're getting them from multiple vendors and things like that. So kind of how to come home with coral after a frag swap and maybe a little bit of data to express that at least at our sample size of one in the St. Louis frag swap. But it was pretty cool. It was a great idea on Ruby's part. So we'll have that article out early next week. After this, we're going to be testing like the, like all, we're going to test all night. I mean, we're doing triplicates. We're using HANA because it's accessible, you know, at the hobby level. A lot of people use them. They're not perfect, obviously, but it's uh, it's something people are used to. So, and a lot of vendors still use HANA-based stuff, you know, in combination with ICP, et cetera. So expressing it as values of those test kits is something that people generally are, like, communicating about as their values. <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty common with a lot of the conservation work. So, you know, like at AIMS and things like that in Australia, they will typically have flow through tanks to where they'll take in ocean water, but put it through very, very low micron filtration to remove any organics or like, or bio, bi rather biological. Um, so they still have all of the um, organic and inorganic chemicals, so to speak, you know, whether it be nutrients or whether it be like traces and things like that. Um, so they basically don't have to dose anything and they have no risk of external contamination because they, it's just like a filter sterilization technique basically. And then they, um, I've seen some like in, in Florida, they'll use sunlight in the Bahamas, like Coral Vita, 
who is experimenting with different types of heat resistant strains of zooxanthellae. They have a flow through system that is lit by the sun. So those are concepts that are really being used in terms of uh, in conservation work with endangered species of corals. Yeah, it certainly seems to be the most efficient, best of both worlds type of scenario. Um, I know there's some people in Florida that are like hobbyists that have greenhouses. I'm not sure if they do how they set that up, but obviously they, they're using the sun. I don't know about a flow through system. That's pretty expensive to maintain with that low micron filtration. It makes sense when you have, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars from the Australian government, but to have it deployed at a more commercial seal, that's a lot of infrastructure and overhead to get up and develop. It's probably possible though, you know, but yeah, that's definitely, definitely a thing that I know about in terms of the commercial side. I don't know, but yeah. Um, I think Vincent does write for us on occasion. Yeah. I think he's, I believe he's actually on, on the staff still. So yeah. Yeah. Vincent's stuff is great. I mean, it's really cool. I think he's just a really busy guy. No comment, Michael. Nothing more will be said about them. Oh, did you have him go like asexual? That's interesting. Must have been eating something. <laughs> or is a stress response. Could be that too. Could be like mesentinial, mesentilial filaments, which like maybe is what the filaments are. Okay, I guess we're officially going to Ohio. <laughs> we're officially going to Ohio now, okay. So we're going to go um, Black Widow, guys. We're going to go to the Tidal Gardens. We're going to go to Eye Catching. We're going to go to, like, what is there in Ohio, dude? <laughs> I don't know. There's Cleveland. Is Cleveland, like, a city that's cool? Like, what is there to do in Ohio? <laughs> yeah, like, like when I think of Ohio, I feel like it's how all of you think of Kansas. Cedar Point. Cedar Point. What is that? I don't Cedar even, Point? Yeah, what is Cedar Point? I'm ignorant. What is that? I don't know what Cedar Point is. It's like Six Flags. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, an amusement park. Yeah, let's go to an amusement park. Yeah, that sounds fun. <laughs> okay, Tyler is also coming to Ohio. <laughs> Ohio gang. Okay, someone came in a photo and asked for a bunch of detritus from one of the main systems that it can cycle. Take a days. What are your thoughts? Sus. Maybe. Right? Like a lot of the nitro fires are going to be aerobic. You could have diazotrophic stuff in there that can maybe participate in nitrate types of cycling. I'm sure you would, I'm sure you could have enough nitro fires present on a patch of detritus to where that could work. But also, a lot of biofilm producers and pathogenic bacteria are going to disproportionately live in pockets of detritus. So, <laughs> more likely than not, you're taking the worst aspect of the microbiome and seeding your tank with it. Like, I don't know, man. <laughs> like at that point, just use just use the bottled nitrifiers. And I can't believe I'm saying that. I haven't, and I really want to. Um, I got scuba certified in a lake in Arkansas. So I'm patty open water certified, but I've never been diving in the ocean. I've been snorkeling in the Caribbean. Um but dude, that's like Gorgonians and fire coral. Like, <laughs> like it was really sad. And that was like five, six, seven. God, that was like a decade ago. Like that was a really long time ago. So yeah, I've never been able to see anything anywhere. Um, so Raj was joking about taking me to Fiji to take my reef virginity, but I hope that happens. All of you should publicly pressure Raj to take me on a tax write-off trip to see the reefs. All of you, all of you go and tag him and say, at Raj, take Salem to Fiji. Oh, there you go. It's starting to cook already. It's time to rock and roll. <laughs> You've got organic production. Something good is happening. Oh, really? That's cool, man. What did you, like, did you do guides or were you like, I feel, like, I feel like you're gonna be like, yeah, I was a deep sea welder, <laughs> worked on oil derricks. <laughs> East River, okay. 
That'd be cool. Four foot barracuda. I don't know if that's like a serious thing, if that's like cool, or if this is like a joke and you're saying you're going to dump my body. Like the East River sounds ominous, man. What East River are you referencing? <laughs> is this like, like, like some like super clear water, like river, like where the manatees are, that's like an estuary, like in Florida, or is this like the East River of Ohio and there's like abandoned cars in the bottom? And if you go magnet fishing, you're going to find a bunch of glocks with like the serial numbers filed off. <laughs> like, where, what are you talking about? I've heard Hawaii is really nice. I've seen a lot of video in Hawaii. I'd love to dive in like Solomon Islands or like Indo or something. I would love to go to Fiji. I really want to go to Fiji. Yes, yeah, cinder blocks and rope in his truck. Let's go to the East River, Salem. Let's go to the East River. What's that in your trunk? Oh, don't worry about it. Just, just for a hobby. <laughs> hobby of mine. Oh, six inches of visibility. It sounds wonderful. I'd love to go. <laughs> That's kind of how the lake I got certified in was. Like we went down, we hit the first thermocline, and that was a crazy experience. And then there was like a huge channel cat in a car. They they purposely sunk cars to have them as um like um oh like landmarks under there to navigate and like to dive for the first time. But dude, it was like it was a massive, it was like river monsters. I'm like, dude, I'm going to get eight. There's no way. This thing's bigger than me. I was like 12 at the time. So like, I'm like a, I'm like five, like six, five, seven. I'm like a short guy now, but I was like a shorter guy then. So it was scary. <clears throat> yeah. Hawaii, I think would be cool. That seems pretty practical. Hawaii trip. All right. What do we got in Hawaii? Let's, let's brainstorm this option. Now we're thinking of brief builders tax write-off trips this episode. So we've got Ohio, we've got New York already planned, we have Florida already planned. It seems the Hawaii needs to be on the list. Is there LFS in Hawaii? I feel like they're probably not. I feel like the trade's like regulated there. <laughs> yeah, what's that place I've always seen on YouTube? It's like um, Raja Amput or something like that, I think, in, in Indo. It looks insane, dude. I watched the video and like cried. I was like, this is beautiful. I hope I get to see this before it's all dead. It's like some super exclusive island resort. It looks like, like, you know, like those sandals commercials in 2008, like when the depression hit or the recession. And it was like, um, you know, what? Oh, he's showing me. Yeah. Raja Amput. Yes, dude. It looks like a sandals or like, like it looks like windows Vista screensaver, dude. Like, dude, do you remember those commercials? Those are nostalgic for me. It was like during 2008, 2009. And it was like, your family doesn't have money right now, but you should sign up for an exclusive warranty to go on this sandals trip. And it was like some super nice place, but like the crappiest like motel to rent there. It was like super exploitive, like, like wannabe like vacation service. It seemed super sketchy to me. And I was like 10 at the time. I don't know if Sandals is actually a legitimate company or if it's if I'm just <laughs> talking out of my ass. But yeah, that was the vibe I got from the style of commercial. Yeah, Raja Amput seems very, very cool. I'd like to go there. <laughs> that sounds cool. Are striped bass invasive in New York? Are you all trying to make really fun plans with me? You're getting me to agree to like crime. Like, I feel like I feel like you're all just taking advantage of my ignorance about these subjects. That or this is like a really cool thing and it sounds fun. But I don't know if it is. This might be the equivalent of like, yeah, we should go to the Everglades and release these Burmese pythons. It'll be great. <laughs> Yeah, Western Australia has like kelp forests, like equivalents of them, right? Like I think I think I saw a picture in like Australophilia are like in like like what looks like a kelp forest. It's like really deep, colder water stuff. I think that'd be cool. I think Northern Aussie, like Darwin, would be a cool location to dive as well. Um, I've heard New Zealand is interesting for temperate diving. There's like a lot of blennies there and stuff like that. I don't know. I want to dive everywhere basically. So Reef builders, if you want to send money to reef builders to for <laughs> I'm not gonna ask I'm not asking for money again. I'm joking. If you've been on the stream before, that should be funny to you. I like to think I'm funny sometimes. Okay, let's see what you just said. 
I have no sifters in my deep sand bed because all the worms will have tried to try to stand and consume it. The grain size of the south, south down play sand keeps it on top of the texture is worm friendly. Hmm. That makes sense. The uh, You do have sifters. You have the worms. They're just uh, natural ones. <laughs> How do I get luminescent dinos in my tank so the fish have lighted tails when they swim? I don't know if you could get enough to, to have a closed loop production where you could have that. I've heard of some people... Like before people were culturing the pyro dinos, right? Um, there was people that I saw like on Reef to Reef or like Reef Central. And they had of like actual, like, you know, the bioluminescent dinos that came in on live rock. And they were able to like, didn't have UV sterilizers or like anything. They had like a hang on back and they had closed loop production. So at nighttime, the tank would glow and the fish swam. It's really cool. I'll have to see if I can find the thread. Um, I would say if you want to try to achieve that, Michael, just buy so much live rock and eventually you might get lucky. <laughs> Aren't the troughs like two feet deep? Like we would just be destroying all the acros, just going through like a bulldozer. Hmm. I didn't know the bankies were colder water as well. That makes sense though. Yeah, I, I keep my systems at 76, which I know is not cold water, but I've seen some like European tanks to where they keep them like at uh, 72, like 68 even I saw. And they have like a lot of the, you know, like trachees, welsos, whatever they're classified as now. They, they look really healthy, like the Aussie trachees um, that, you know, are pretty rough when they come in. Typically, they always don't do too well, but they look excellent. Weirdest animal I've owned. Huh. We've got a brown jelly tank right now. That's pretty weird. That's a consortium of animals, but uh, it's the polymicrobial component of it. A lot of it can't be cultured with existing techniques. It's unculturable. So um, you got to just keep the infection going. So I've got a little nice fluval all-in-one. I got this little cabinet from Ikea. It was going to be an NPS display tank. I nuked my NPS system because I dosed so much Bacillus subtilis to feed them because I kept upping the ante being a, being a bad boy, and then I consumed all the oxygen and it crashed the tank. So, <laughs> so then I just started throwing jelly samples in it, and now I feed it a uh, candy cane colony every week to keep it going for my research. So that's the weirdest animal I have is a polymicrobial pathobiont. I've had like bobbit worms I've kept too for fun. <laughs> We keep our house open on the spring and fall. So my tank is 80, 80 year round to avoid large swings. Um, if your corals are used to it, not necessarily, but there's a lot of data that even pushing it to 80 for some species can be pretty stressful in terms of thermal stress. Um, like I say, I like to keep my tanks cooler. Just gives you more wiggle room, slows, you know, overall bacterial growth, things like that. Thank you. I love Godzilla. Godzilla is awesome. I grew up watching Godzilla. Never owned a reptile. Never. Um, I really wanted to get newts. So I finally got um, <laughs> I finally got disposable income. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get some fire belly newts. And then I'm like, oh, in 2015, they became ba like banned for import. All newts and salamanders, you can't bring them in because there was some weird fungal issue coming from Asia that was wiping out indigenous uh, newts and salamanders. So I was like, oh, man. Um, you can get them captive bred, but they're like 600 bucks for like an alpine newt, which they're cool, but like I'd rather buy like a stick or something, you know? But uh, yeah, Nile monitor. <laughs> Empty handed again. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> Always. But uh, yeah. That was kind of like a really sporadic and random recap. We're going to be organized next week. We've just been, dude, we had reef stock, and then I got sick from reef stock, and now I'm in St. Louis. It just, uh, it's been a hectic time, but we're going to have the acro tier list next week. So if you want to vote for what your favorite acro is, we're going to have it interactive, and we could do the acro tier list. We can do a whole episode of the acro, acro tier list if you guys want. But, hmm. Uh, <clears throat> So I don't know if temp swings are a big deal. Thermal, like, like if you have a big one, yes. But think about the ocean. There's like um, there's like vertical thermoclines and stuff, right? Like I feel like corals might be naturally 
resilient to swings in a certain range. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, 82 gets a little high. I think above 80, it's starting to get a little teetering on the edge for stuff that's less thermally tolerant or fresher stuff. If you have stuff that's not aquacultured, that can be dangerous, I think. Like I say, I like to keep it cool. So you can always get a chiller. It's expensive though, but uh, yeah. But yeah, I think we'll we'll call it good for tonight. Say a little little short one tonight. So thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. It'll be uh, interactive and fun next week. But yeah, we appreciate you coming to the recap. Hope you had fun tonight. Um, I hope you realize that we need a taxonomy person on reef builders. So if there's someone you know that's good at taxonomy, um, have them send us an application. So thanks and uh, keep on reefing and uh, go Cardinals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.